Hi, welcome back. So this is the second video on the Quasar Graphic OLED display. If you've not watched part one, you should go and watch that first. There's a link up in the top corner. Come back when you've seen it. In this video, what I'll be doing is going through how I program the display using C and assembly mixed together. So if you're a programmer and wondered why anyone would subject themselves to assembly programming, stay tuned. But sit tight, this is gonna get quite technical. So what I'm going to show is how to get static images onto the display. I'm not doing any fancy line drawing or anything like that. That would be possible, but I'm just going for basic bitmaps on a screen. Because I don't want to pay Adobe for any software, I'm using paint.net. All I've done is set up an image the correct size, and then when I save it, I just make sure it's only got two colours, so black and white. The black bit gets lit up, the white bit doesn't. So to convert the image into something I can actually use, I didn't really want to go to the effort of understanding a bitmap image to pull the pixels out of it. So I had a bit of a think, and I remembered back from really old Linux days that PBM files are pretty much human readable text. So I'm using Irfan View, and all I'm doing is going to convert it into a PBM. You can use batch conversion if you want to do lots in one go, which is what I normally do. But it's as simple as doing save as, changing this bit to portable bitmap, and then on here, making sure it's using ASCII encoding and then you just give it a name and press save and it's done. Because I want an easy life, I'm using Visual Studio Code. I'd like to tell you it's because it's an excellent editor and natively understands Windows for Subsystem Linux instances, but it's more because I like the default font and color scheme. If you're going to spend hours staring at a program, it may as well look nice, you know? It's got a nice purple bit and dark mode actually looks decent. To do any programming, we're going to need some tools. So I'm using Z88DK, which seems to be the standard C compiler for Z80 CPUs. It comes for a variety of operating systems, but as I'm using the Windows subsystem for Linux, I'm downloading the source code and compiling it. So yeah, compiling a compiler, that is indeed a thing. Now that we've seen the screen in action, I want to go over how it works, because I'm curious how the screen even knows we want to talk to it when other things are also on the bus. Like, how come it doesn't interpret writes to the serial I.O. chip as video data, etc. Now before we begin this bit, I need a disclaimer. I'm not an electronics engineer, and my detailed understanding of IC-based logic is quite limited. I think I've got the general gist of this, but I'm not entirely 100% sure, so if this is completely wrong, be sure to tell me how wrong I am in the comments down below. So the board is split into three parts. We've got the OLED display itself, which is a self-contained module with its own processor. It seems to be 5 volt tolerant because I can't see any level shifting chips. Then there's a pair of 8-bit D-type latches, and they're used for buffering the board with the I.O. pins. And it also allows a relatively slow OLED display to communicate with the faster Z80 bus. Yes, the 10 MHz bus is too fast for this screen. So the way this board seems to work is this rightmost latch is connected directly to the screen. You can actually follow the traces on the back. And it's also connected to the data bits. It's connected to D0 to D7. The data you want to send to the screen goes through there, is buffered and goes into there. There is then a load of address and control lines which are connected to the other latch. This circuitry here is a bit like a hardware if statement. It's just saying if the bits that are set on these jumpers matches the bits that are being set on the address bus, then we're going to activate these two chips so that the data can go into the screen. So this program is split into four different pieces. The first part is just some basic file handling to open the file up. And all it does is opens the file, it then reads out the image header and promptly ignores it. It then gets out a comment that seems to be put in and then stores the dimensions of the image, the width and the height. I don't actually really use them. Well, I do, but I could ignore it because I'm the one deciding that these images are a certain size due to the size of the screen. But I store them anyway because they're useful. 
The second bit actually reads in the data. Now the data is stored as ones and zeros as our actual ASCII characters and each one and zero represents a bit. So what I need to do first is to allocate enough memory to store those bits. Then I go into a loop and what this loop does is it first reads a line of characters up to the terminating new line and then for each one of those characters it reads every other character because inside the file it's stored as a 1 or a 0 with a space between it. And then what I do is I check whether I've read a 0 or I've read a 1 and I then just set a 1 and a 0. I probably could have done this using some maths instead but this works anyway. After that I close the file and we're done reading in the bits. What we should have then is an array that is full of actual bits. So this bit converts the pixels from the image into the pixels on the display. In the image, each pixel just goes across the screen for the full width, so there's 128 pixels across. Then the next pixel, 129, is on the second line, and it just goes across as a standard bitmap, just like pictures normally are. What I need to do though with that is to convert it into the format the screen understands. And what it's expecting is that I feed it um, bytes at a time and each byte represents 8 pixels vertically. So you can think of this screen as having 4 rows of 8 pixel bytes and there's 128 of those 8 pixel columns. So it's like it needs to read every pixel from the top line and store it as the topmost bit. Then it needs to read the next set of pixels and store those as the second bit and so on for 8 bits to make up a row of bytes and then do that 4 times to make the whole screen. There's a diagram on the screen which hopefully makes a bit more sense. Right, the final section of code, all this does is it prints out the C code um, of the columns of bits that it's just created so that I can copy and paste it into the source file of the actual program. And then it's done. So the previous program, all it prints out on the screen is this data here. So it's an unsigned character array at 512 bytes and then it's just all the bytes as they're needed in the format the screen expects. I can then copy and paste that into my main actual program. So you can see I've got lots of images here. This program is actually compiled into Z80. The previous one was just some Linux source code. First we need to tell the compiler where to put the code in memory. So it starts at memory location 8000. And then there's some other configuration for where the stack starts. These are external functions that are declared in assembly, and I'll show you those in a minute. Okay, each one of those is based on the code out of the instruction manual for the display. After that, you've just got all the different images. What I've got then is a few defines that just delay running of the code for some amounts of time that seem to look decent on the display. We then get into the main actual code. So first we initialize the screen, we clear it, and I can't remember what the set full screen does. I think it's one of the configuration parameters to set up how the screen works. We then go into a main loop. And it's just a repeating pattern of doing some animation. So it calls this draw image function, and I pass into it one of those arrays. I then call the delay uh, macro and then draw another image and so on. And because it's in a loop, it just keeps doing that forever. So this program is not really very clever, it's not doing anything special. All it does is copies each image to the display, waits a bit of time and then copies the next one. So here we go, here's the assembly. It's stored in its own file 
it's not just inlined with the C source code, this seems to work better. Plus it's much easier to type it out than any other way. So first I need to define all the names of the functions. They all start with an underscore on this bit and I found this out through trial and error because when I compiled it, it complained it couldn't find the functions with an underscore. So I put those in. Each one of these functions is actually explained in the manual, so I'm not going to go through it in any great detail. But this one resets the display. All these no operations here are used just as a way of delaying the screen update so that the screen has time to react. The screen is very much slower than the machine. Even a 10 megahertz Z80 CPU is faster than this screen is. So this function here, all this does is it sends a data packet to the display. The screen understands two things, data and commands. And it's based on um, this bit here, depending which one you set in. And it's then got some delays here so that the CPU waits for the screen to process the instruction before it sends another one. Right, this bit's quite interesting because this is the function that I call from the C program. So this is OLED draw image, which I call in the C program all over the place. Okay, it's the main function that I'm calling. And I'm passing into it a pointer. I need to get the contents of the stack first. So the first thing on the stack is the return address. And then the next item on the stack is the address of the image data, so I'm storing that. I then need to put the stack back together again, so I need to put the return address and the image data back on in the order that they came off. So that when you return out the function, um, all the code in the background that handles calling a function from C can put itself back together, otherwise you end up returning to the wrong location, because when you return pops these off to get the return address again. So if the stack doesn't contain the return address and the image data, when it pops them off, it'll find something else and not know where to go back to. So that's what this bit's for. Figuring out this calling convention took quite a lot of trial and error and searching of various websites to find out how to do it. This bit here is then just a loop and all it does is it gets a byte from the image data and it sends it to the screen and it does it in a loop until it's finished and that's it there's not much else to that one last thing this sequence of bytes here is mentioned in the manual and I just typed them all in but if you actually go onto the website of the OLED displays um, manufacturer and you get their data sheet you'll find that all of these are commands for setting up specific things about the screen so it sets up what order it expects the image to be in or what some of the different timings do with the screen refresh so in my program i've got two different languages being used at the same time i've got assembly and i've got c and ultimately the c also gets turned back into assembly when it's compiled and linked together so as far as the compiler is concerned, there's nothing different going on. But from our point of view with programming this, we need to somehow connect the two together and there's a procedure for doing this. So the first step is I wrote the code and I made sure it functioned as a subroutine. So there is a return statement at the end and I gave it a label that identifies it. I then had to declare that label as being public so that the linker can export that and everything else can find it. That's why over here in the C source, I've declared the same thing as external. And for some reason I don't quite understand, it needs an underscore here, but on this one it doesn't. I've then said that it's going to take one parameter, which is a pointer to a character string. That is a 16-bit um, argument. Okay, the fact it's 16-bit is quite important. I got quite confused trying to pass in single characters in a different one. It always passes in 16-bit, so it tries to pad it out. 
So then in my code, I just call it like any other C function. So I pass in my data and I call it. When it gets called, it uses the stack. So you can imagine that we've got the stack. So to call our assembly code from within C, we need to follow a specific process. And this differs depending on which compiler you're using and which machine it is and everything else. There's no one standard. In the system I'm using, it appears that when you want to call a function, the first thing that gets put onto the stack is the parameters. So the address of that image goes on the stack. Then it puts on the return address. And the return address is just the next place to go in the program, which is going to be here. And then it sets the program counter to be the function. So we go over here. So now we can access these things. I want to get this here, this pointer to the image. I don't really care about the return address. That's nothing my code actually needs to do anything with. But I still need to get it out of the stack to be able to get to the image that I want. So I first have to get the return address and store it somewhere because then I can get the image data pointer. And then because of the calling convention that exists, I then have to put these back in so the stack still looks like this. Because after doing all this code, this return instruction, what it will do is pop this off and use it. And then I think it just pops that off and ignores it to get rid of it. I'm not quite sure what happens to the parameters. Either way, this is how the stack is used to get from C into assembly. I think if you're returning data, you can put it on the stack. And then if I declared it not as void, but as something else, this would get popped off and reused as the return address. So I think this just gets popped off anyway but then he's just abandoned by the program because I'm not doing an assignment. So there you go. That's how you can combine C and assembly code in the same program and then run it on a small 8-bit computer. I hope that you found that interesting. If you did, it'd be awesome if you gave it a thumbs up. If you're not already subscribed and you've made it this far through the video, maybe consider pressing the button. If not, just wait for another video to come out soon. Future videos are going to be more about the Spectrum Next, which is what you're looking at on the screen at the moment. What I've done so far with the RC2014 has been really useful. I've now learnt some Z80 and I understand how the CPU is working in much more detail than I used to. So what I want to do now is level up my understanding and try and get into writing more complex code. I might come back to the RC2014 in the future if I find any more fun little projects. I think it's going to remain a sort of hardware learning platform that I can use to just test out ideas. I'm also going to do more things than just a Spectrum Next though. So there will be some more hardware building that I want to get done. I've got those Atari ST upgrades to do and something to do with a Raspberry Pi 4 when the rest of it arrives. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching.